Welcome to the first of our lecture series. This series is about the grove, so let's begin with the story. Once upon a time, there dwelled on the outskirts of a large forest a poor woodcutter with his wife and two children. The boy was called Hansel and the girl Gretel. He always had little to live on, and once, when times were bad, they had to get by with one piece of bread and butter each. One night, as he was tossing about in bed, worrying, he sighed and said to his wife, What's to become of us? How are we to feed our poor children, now that we have nothing more for ourselves? I'll tell you what, husband, answered the woman. Early tomorrow morning, we'll take the children out into the thickest part of the woods. There we shall light a fire for them and give them each a piece of bread. Then we'll go on to our work and leave them alone. They won't be able to find their way home, and we shall be rid of them. No, wife, said her husband. That I won't do. How could I find it in my heart to leave my children alone in the woods? The wild beasts would soon come and tear them to pieces. Now, long story short, Hansel and Gretel made it back home, only after having to murder a witch in the forest. Most relevant to us is, why are there fires being lit in the forest, witches being slayed by children, and why does poverty lead one into the grove? For we all know that getting into the grove is the easy part, but leaving it, is entirely another mission. In fact, many live their whole lives without ever realizing they're in the grove. Thus it is our moral responsibility to ensure that every human is made aware of the poetics of the grove. This series will do precisely that. In this video, I'm going to provide an overview of what to expect for the remainder of the series. So, let us again ask ourselves, what grove? Most of you know of academia. Academia is an olive grove outside the city walls of Athens, Greece, the sacred site of the goddess Athena, goddess of wisdom. The archaic name for the site is Hecademia, after the Attic hero Hecademus, honored for heroically saving the city. Now, Plato, the academic, delivered his lectures to his students in this grove, hence the academy. Perhaps now is the time to remind our academics of the significance of their official status, that the academics belong to the grove, she to none. <laughs> As Barnett reminds us, the sacred groves of ancient Greece were designed for the specific purpose of linking the sacred realm of the gods and the profane world of humans. The terrain occupied by a grove was carefully delineated as separate and different from the landscapes of ordinary life. The sacred grove is therefore a threshold space, a portal to the domain of disorder. As such, it shares characteristics with nonlinear systems that require disturbance in order to remain emergent and transformative. Further, that the sacred groves permit the passage of the sacred into human systems by means of the loving and transgressive gift of sacrifice. Thus, if the infamous last words of Plato's teacher, Socrates, founds for the academics their duty to continually perform sacrifice, that we owe a cock to Asclepius, pay it and don't forget, then the first maxim of the grove is that tradition is both the worship of ashes and the preservation of fire. Long gone are the days of Socrates, and now the philologists and neuropsychiatrists unite to bellow the flames of a new sacrifice, throwing mere boys into its pits and divining men, not orcs, in return. This sentiment was captured by Tolkien in his work Tree and Leaf in 64, where he wrote, A real taste for fairy stories was wakened by philology on the threshold of manhood and quickened to full life by war. C.S. Lewis, in commenting on Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, writes, The value of myth is that it takes all the things you know and restores to them the rich significance which has been hidden by the veil of familiarity. In keeping with this sentiment, 
Another voice of the Grove once wrote, For the first time in the process of psychological studies, we can resolve essentially purely philosophical problems by means of a psychological experiment, and demonstrate empirically the origins of the freedom of human will. Now many once thought this was blasphemous, but the neuropsychiatrists of today know that Vygotsky was onto something. Indeed, one of the oldest voices of the Grove continues to echo. Now the people who know this, and the people here in the wilderness who venerate thus, asceticism is faith. They pass into the flame. This is the path leading to the gods. But why? Why now, and why the Grove? Because academics love to reinvent the wheel. And sometimes, being renowned egoists, they fail to appreciate the disciplined work of others in the grove. Worse, some disciplines pretend to speak on behalf of all others, or they attempt to sabotage them. Thus we need an unbiased, interdisciplinary means of acquiring wisdom. And wisdom ought to improve our lives, not hold them hostage to unattainable hypotheticals of non-ascetics. There's been a drought the grove needs watering, and the ascetics shall transpire, as usual. My mission is to get us in and out of the grove, providing us with the necessary expertise to understand its poetics, and to become familiar with the habits of thought shared by all humans. We'll first acquire a rigorous and comprehensive understanding of wisdom, starting with language, the means by which we organize wisdom, and culminating in neuroscience, the means by which we embody that wisdom. And somewhere in between this organizing and embodying, the grove grows slightly. And we're going to pinpoint the exact origin of these poetics, and thereby place the ascetic's morality back into the grove. We're going to learn to partake in the oldest living oral tradition of sacred poetics, the grove. Now, scientists often proclaim that the proof is in the pudding, but older voices will now respond back, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. With this, we're going to provide the humanities with a framework to interpret whatever the occasional neuroscientist opines about humanity in public. We're going to call this framework dialectical neuroscience. We're going to begin with language and hermeneutics. Now, I know that not everyone knows what hermeneutics means. And so, throughout this entire series, I'm going to define everything. I'm going to assume no prior understanding, no prior education. We're going to begin from first principles. So let's start with language. Language is a system of communication. And hermeneutics is the study of interpretation. After that, we'll move on to mythology and history, where mythology is the study of sacred narratives and history the study of past events. And then we'll proceed to ritual theory. Now, ritual theory is the study of rituals or focused interactions, which are at the heart of all social dynamics. Again, the goal is not to overwhelm ourselves with disconnected facts. Instead, it will be to filter the excess repetitions into a more comprehensive map to navigate back and forth from language to neuroscience. Then we'll proceed to asceticism. Severe self-discipline and avoidance of all forms of indulgence. And then we'll address sacred poetics which we can say is a system of meaning optimized for effectively symbolizing that sacredness. Then we'll proceed to psychology, which is the study of the soul, and psychoanalytics, which was meant to be a method of treatment of disorders of the soul. Then we'll proceed to political theory, the study of governing systems and their agents. Then we'll make it to literary theory, which is the bastard child of philology, the study of language, 
still seeking to overthrow its father and unite with its mother. Now obviously the literary theorists agree. For I cite here a literary theorist who once wrote, It is silly to call fat people gravitationally challenged, a self-righteous fetishism of language, which is no more than a symptom of political frustration. And the Grove shares in that sentiment. Then we'll proceed to social theory, which is the study of how self-regulating agents interact with others. And lastly, we'll come to neuroscience, the wisdom of body, soul, and fire. Thus, with this conceptual ordering in mind, we'll make seven threads to weave that to supersede the rest. We will begin with the book titled The Science of Thought by Max Muller. It consists of lectures and essays that encompass a variety of topics, the most relevant to us being language, thought, etymology, grammar, psycholinguistics, philology, indology, and metaphysics. Now the book is based on lectures that he gave at the Royal Institution in 1873 on the philosophy of language, and the other portions are essays that he wrote in response to a book called The Origin of Language in his essay called The Origin of Reason. Now our goal with this book will be to familiarize ourselves with language the vehicle through which we will organize all our thoughts and ideas about everything. This book will allow us to create a rigorous map of language, and this will aid us in interpreting obtuse and abstract arguments by later authors. Now, the most important skill we will acquire from this book will be cultivating an intuition of how to use language beyond simplistic descriptions. That is to say, treating words as variables to construct more abstract structures to invoke multiple meanings simultaneously. We will also be dealing with foundations and metaphysics, and that most problems that thinkers face are typically problems with language. Then we will tackle the most important book in this series, The Natural History of Negation by Lawrence Horne. Horne offers a unique synthesis of past and current work on the structure, meaning, and use of negation and negative expressions and provides a comprehensive review of scholarship on negation in both natural language and thought. Now I should point out here that negation is the most important concept of the grove. In fact, it is the concept of the grove, the concept of ascetics. And once you understand this as such, you will never look at language nor the world the same way again. This much is guaranteed. In fact, this and Mueller's book capture essentially all we'll ever need to know to map the entirety of human discourse. You will be able to speak to any thinker that has ever traversed the grove, theologian or theorist, and speak their language. The rest of the books are more of an exercise in mapping these first principles, proofs of concept that will help orient our habits of thought towards the grove and its inhabitants. Now I should mention, I don't accept the entirety of the conclusions in Horn nor Mueller's books, but the journey they've taken to reach their conclusions is far more significant. Trekking the grove without a map would take multiple lifetimes, and narrating tales at campfires alone is unproductive. And every hero needs a high priest. Having grasped the importance of language and negation, we will make our way through a short essay by Madan Agrawal, which will provide us a historical backdrop, a kind of overview of the doctrine of difference and non-difference in the Vedic tradition. This will allow us to examine how the various doctrines and debates in foundational theology are organized around this concept of negation, for there isn't a thinker that hasn't struggled with negation. Next, we will take a deep dive into the sacred poetics of the Vedas with the help of Tatyana Lysenrenkova by her book, Language and Style of the Vedic Rishis. 
Now Tatiana explains to us the relationships between Vedic grammatical systems and the peculiarities of style of the archaic religious poetry. For example, the concept of time as a circular process bears closely to the use of the verbal grammatical categories of tense and mood. The personification of some abstract forces can explain some irregularities in the functioning of the nominal category of gender. And the idea of power attributed to sacred speech in general, and to the name of a particular god, underlies the magical grammar of these sacred poetics. Now the goal of this book will be to delight in the sacred poetics of the Rig Veda, and further develop proficiency in scriptural exegesis. We will continue our mapping exercise in sacred poetics, which we had begun with Max Muller's book. By the end of this reading, you will be able to open any hymn of the Rig Veda and see the imagery of the sacred poetics come to life all around you. Hopefully, we will acquire a sense of moral responsibility and maturity when discussing any and all sacred poetics, which have echoed through the grove, and establish a hierarchy of expectations for those longing to be their exegetes. There will be no more hiding behind religious labels. The proof of the pudding is in the eating. Then we will begin our journey into mythological motifs and archetypes with the help of Michael Witzel. The origins of the world's mythologies. Now Witzel focuses on the oldest available textual and anthropological data to reconstruct a single original African source for all our collective myths, dating back to some 100,000 years. And he proposes a very ambitious out of Africa theory of mythology, which provides the earliest evidence of ancient spirituality. And having acquired a solid understanding of sacred poetics, we will be able to see the limitations of Witzel's reconstructions, but also enhance some of his other insights. But whether Witzel is right or wrong in his hypothesis is inconsequential, for our focus will be in absorbing and mapping out the terrain of the grove. Thus we will map this comprehensive vision of cross-cultural mythologies and their associated archetypes, paying attention to how the authors make linguistic arguments to define and structure sacred poetics. Then we will proceed to history, Tracing the Indo-Europeans, which is a set of essays that provide a fairly comprehensive historical perspective on the geographical origins and subsequent migrations of the, of the Indo-European languages, and by extension, their society and culture. The selection of papers illustrate the importance of an open interdisciplinary discussion which will help us in our quest of tracing the Indo-Europeans. The goal of reading this book will be to gain a historical and material sense for the various traditions that have contributed to the broad Indo-European identity, and thereby its sacred poetics. Appreciating the notion of a historical perspective while interpreting any traditional body of literature. Now these essays are fairly easy to read, but to us, it will be more important to see how the authors employ or neglect the sacred poetics in their attempts at reconstructing the past. To us English speakers, this is our heritage, and it lives in the words being uttered at this very moment. If the grove of the East and the West were ever going to unite, then Indo-European is certainly the perfect metaphor to capture this project, for not all Aryans are German. Building on the theme of reconstructing history, we will offer our attention as sacrifice to The Black Hunter by Pierre Vidal Naquet. This book will offer a systematic demonstration of much of the Indo-European poetics we will have developed up to this point by charting the elaborate system of oppositions that pervaded Greek culture and society. The cultivated and the wild, the citizen and the foreigner, the real and the imaginary, the gods and man. This book frames the dialectical model around four key themes, space and time, youth and warriors, women and slaves and artisans, the city of vision and of reality. It focuses on the congruence of the textual and the actual, on the patterns that link literary, philosophical and historical works with such social activities as war, slavery, education and commemoration. Lastly, it probes the interplay of worldview, language, and social practice. And our goal will be to begin appreciating how the organization of abstract ideas, as we find them encoded in our systems of language, manifest in various realms outside the grove. 
Though this book focuses on the milieu of ancient Greeks, it serves as an important reminder of why sacred poetics, when taken historically and sometimes too literally, can result in disastrous interpretations of data, something the psychologists of late have been replicating in crisis. Then, having demonstrated how sacred poetics manifest in social practice, we will proceed to the ritual process proper, with the help of Victor Turner. This book examines rituals of the Ndembu in Zambia and develops the now famous concept of communitas, which is defined as an absolute interhuman relation that is non-institutional. It demonstrates how the analysis of ritual behavior and symbolism may be used to understand social structure and processes. Particularly, rituals are understood as arenas in which social change may emerge and be absorbed into social practice. Turner extends Arnold Van Nepp's notion of the liminal phase of rites of passage to a more general level and applies it to gain understanding of a wide range of social phenomena. Now the goal here will be to demonstrate how rituals in human cultures in general go beyond classical simplistic explanations of ritualism and that the level of complexity in social organization is not indicative of the forms of ideological and conceptual organization that is manifest in any given society. This work puts to task those who neglect the rich symbolism that rituals encode and shows just how significant rituals are for long-term, broad-viewed organization of agents. That one cannot neglect the behaviors nor the symbols of a given action and assume they've understood the function of a ritual process. We will then take a deep dive into this theme of rituals with Ritual Theory and Ritual Practice by Catherine Bell, which re-examines various issues, methods, and ramifications of the academic's interest in ritualism. Bell provides a sufficiently broad framework for rituals in general, coining the famous term ritualization which is conceptualized as a strategy for establishing social relations through the symbolic ordering of a particular environment. Now, this concept offers an important nuance in the establishment of social hierarchies, and our goal will be to acquire a rigorous backdrop of ritual theory and reorient various disparate notions of ritual into a coherent language when talking about them, and especially learning to guard against naive critiques of ritual formalism. With this newfound appreciation for rituals, it will be impossible to see the human as anything other than a ritualizing agent, and that humans find matter out of place to make those places matter. I am certain that Catherine can teach our social psychologists a thing or two beyond a standard p-value. Next, we'll attend Vedic prosody, and Arvind Sharma will be our guide in the short essay of Shudras, Suttas, and Shlokas. Now, this paper examines the relationship between Vedic prosody, or Vedic meters, with literary production in Sanskrit intellectual circles, and demonstrates how while the Anushtub meter is sparsely represented in the Vedas, it is the standard meter of post-Vedic religious literature of Hinduism that's available in Sanskrit, arguing ultimately that the Vedic prosody is itself encoding semantic content. Our goal here will be to continue our mapping exercise in Vedic poetics and imagery by closely studying Vedic prosody. Then we will hear from Jan Gonda in his work, The Vision of Vedic Poets. Now Gonda challenges the standard translation of the Sanskrit word the with thought and investigates the meaning, significance, and semantic development of the term in Vedic religion. Now, Jan's critique of naive translations and his insights on the notion of insight in the Vedic tradition allows us to further map the Vedic poetics, paying attention to the use and study of etymology and etymological verb roots and comparative linguistics to reconstruct the relevant semantics and pragmatic connotations of Sanskrit terminology. Furthermore, we will be able to detail the nuances between conventional insight and sacred ones as understood by the high priests. Now, I couldn't think of a better book to bring together much of the preceding ideas and concepts than Stahl's monumental work, Agni. This book provides a comprehensive study of the Vedic Agnichayana ritual, a shrata ritual, or a public ritual, 
that was meant to be performed as a public spectacle. This book is an important demonstration in how dogma and praxis unite in the ritual act, thus generating highly recursive forms which link language and behavior, microcosm and macrocosm, and various other oppositions that govern sacred poetics. Our goal will be to attentively study how language and ritual unite in the Agni Chayana, thereby establishing the appropriate frames for interpreting ascetic models of internalizing the ritual, which is found in later literature on meditation and spirituality. Stahl, who is renowned for interpreting ritual as rules without meaning, like a mathematician, is the perfect transition point between the boundary of the external ritual and the internalization of that ritual, which if I were being mischievous could say is meaning without rules, but the more ascetic articulation is rules with meaning. That is to say, every gesture is precise because it embodies the tapta marga. Walter Kelber will be the voice to walk us through the tapta marga, the heated passage, to provide us with the most comprehensive study of tapas, or heat, and its relation to asceticism during the Vedic period, the internalization of the ritual proper. The book highlights three other essential components of Vedic thought, that's sacrifice, homology, and knowledge. And these concepts, along with tapas and initiation symbolism, reveals key self-organizing principles of the Vedic ritual and Vedic theology. Now our goal here will be to appreciate how the sacred poetics manifest themselves in the technicalities of the Vedic ritual. And having come this far, it will be nearly impossible to argue otherwise. And I hope the insight will have been worth the wait. Possessing insight and fire, we will be bringing the gods to mind with the help of Laurie Patton. Laurie offers us a new way of thinking about the role of mantra in Vedic ritual as performed poetry, and in five case studies draws a portrait of early Indian sacrifice that moves beyond the well-worn categories of magic and magical religious thought in Vedic sacrifice. Laurie treats Vedic mantra as a sophisticated form of artistic composition to refine the idea of metonymy, or associational thought, as a major motivator for the use of mantra in sacrificial performance. The goal will be to familiarize ourselves with the concept of mantra in the Vedic tradition and of music. Lori was the one who reminded me, those who carefully reviewed and went over and over again all that pertained to the rituals of the gods were called religious. Speaking of Stoics, we will then study the dynamics between ascetics and Brahmins, and Patrick Oliville will formally introduce the image of the world-renouncing ascetic which remains central to all the major traditions of the world, particularly in South Asia, and consists of marked theological doctrines. These ascetical institutions and ideologies developed in a creative tension with other religious institutions that stress the centrality of family, procreation, and society. And it is this tension that has articulated many of the central features of Indian religions and cultures. The various Indian ascetical traditions, for example, Buddhism and Jainism, are situated within their historical context in this book. Our goal will be to formally introduce asceticism, its dialectical role in the Vedic milieu, and how it seamlessly extends the sacred poetics of the Vedic ritual, the Tapta Marga. That is, there is no ritualism without asceticism. This work presents the dialect between the householder and the grove, in guise of Brahmins and ascetics. And having made the journey inwards to the grove, like all ascetics do, we will find refuge in the words of the high priest Carl Jung. Jeffrey Miller will guide us through Jung's model of psychological growth, in particular his transcendent function. The transcendent function is one of Carl Jung's core theory of psychological growth and at the heart of what he calls individuation, the process by which one is guided in a teleological way toward the person one is meant to be. Our goal with this book will be to trace the history of imaginary, complex, and transcendent concepts in mathematics, whose exegesis has provided members in the Grove with much concern about the unification of theology and mathematics. 
We will delve deep into the foundations of mathematics with our sacred poetics, only to find the same old concerns being rebranded by newborn mystics. I'd like for us to appreciate how the sacred poetics in the grove are captured in secular form in Jung's model of psychological growth. Having taken pleasure in the voice of Jung, the psychiatrist, we will go beyond the pleasure principle with Freud, the neurologist. We will again see how the poetics of the Black Hunter are being rebranded in psychological theory. Freud's essay, Beyond the Pleasure Principle, marks Freud's major revision of his drive theory, which elaborates on the struggle between two opposing drives, Eros, which produces creativity, harmony, sexual connection, reproduction, and self-preservation, and what he calls the death drive, which brings destruction, repetition, aggression, compulsion, and self-destruction. The process of creating living cells binds energy and creates an imbalance, he writes. It is the pressure of matter to return to the original state which gives cells their quality of living. The compulsion of the matter in cells to return to a diffuse, inanimate state extends the whole of living organisms. And it is by this entropic principle that Freud really discovers the ontological importance of negative theology and asceticism. Thus the psychological death wish is a manifestation of an underlying physical compulsion present in every cell, which Freud directly corresponds to the death drive. The short essay will set up the context for a deep dive into the imagery of civilization and its discontents. Now it was between Max Weber and Sigmund Freud, so I flipped a coin and it landed on tails. So naturally, Freud won and we had to leave behind Weber in the iron cage. Civilization and its discontents essentially enumerates a fundamental tension between civilization and the individual. The primary friction between the two stems from the individual's quest for instinctive freedom and civilization's contrary demand for conformity and the repression of instincts. When any situation that is desired by the pleasure principle is prolonged, it creates a feeling of mild contentment. Civilization creates laws that prohibit killing, rape, and adultery, and it implements severe punishments if these rules are broken, since they are harmful to the well-being of the community. And Freud believes this gives rise to perpetual feelings of discontent amongst his citizens. Our goal here will be to acquire familiarity with psychoanalytic theory and its poetic imagery. The incorporation of asceticism being the principal link that takes it beyond a mere descriptive model of observations and orients it towards a causal analysis of human agency, or in the words of Jung, teleology. By now in the series, we will have an intuition for ideas and where they come from. Thus, we will examine how the ascetics of the grove conceive of sovereignty. Theodore Proferis, in the book Vedic Ideals of Sovereignty and the Poetics of Power, examines a number of central poetic motifs in the ancient Indian liturgical corpus that express and reflect ideals of sovereignty, political unity, and cosmic power. The general argument is that the authors of the early Vedic liturgical texts communicate and ritualize the ideals of sovereignty by ways of poetic tropes involving fire, water, and solar imagery. Since ritualists portray rules as relatively independent, the poetic language of sovereignty began to incorporate ideals of freedom and self-determination. This is the Tapta Marga. In the classical ritual traditions of the Brahmanas and early Upanishads, all men eligible to perform rituals whether of royal standing or not, use such lofty language to express their desires for spiritual autonomy and power. And our goal in this book will be to see how the sacred gets translated into the political realm through the rigorous system of poetics, which is established by the high priests, the ascetics. Now of the countless demonstrations of the dialectical form of organization in the political realm, Hobbes was the most overt and clear with his poetics. And so I've decided to include his voice too, as opposed to, say, Plato's Republic. I mean, there really isn't a page where Plato isn't breathing through Hobbes, so I think we're on safe grounds here. Hobbes' book Leviathan claims that man's essential nature is competitive and selfish, and therefore he rejects Aristotle's view of man as an unnaturally social being. And so Hobbes, taking this idea, formulates the case for a powerful sovereign, or Leviathan, which is meant to enforce peace and the law to the modernist sensibility, 
substituting security for the archaic freedom human beings otherwise would experience. With this book, our goal will be to compare the poetics and structural ideals of this classical work on liberalism with the ancient model of state and sovereignty. It will allow us to attend to the use of sacred poetics in a dialectical manner to organize the language of political discourse. Then we're going to proceed on to study a key concept of political theory, which is ideology. And Louis Althusser will be the best voice for this. This book contains a series of essays that study how particular political and cultural ideas come to dominate a society. Althusser attempts to develop a practice of philosophy as a kind of revolutionary weapon. And I'll take a quote from this book, where he writes, In the history of Western reason, every care, foresight, precaution, and warning has been devoted to birth. Prenatal therapy is institutional. When a young science is born, the family circle is always ready for astonishment, jubilation, and baptism. For a long time, every child, even the foundling, has been reputed the son of a father, and when it is a prodigy, the fathers would fight at the gate if it were not for their mother and the respect due to her. In our crowded world, a place is allocated for birth. A place is even allocated for the prediction of a birth. Perspective. Now, Althusser is essentially setting the backdrop for the birth of dialectical neuroscience. And so our goal will be to understand how both asceticism and negative theology has been made critical. Reading these essays after having studied the sacred poetics will allow us to see the various attempts at innovations or births from the grove and to make the specter of Marxism less terrifying to the imagination of conservatives. I am reminded of the saying of Trotsky, we Marxists live in tradition and we have not stopped being revolutionists on account of it. Now we will remain specters of this tradition from the ranks of the grove and see just how helpful their appropriation of asceticism and its sacred poetics have been. Now that we know what ideology means, we will take on another classical example of the dialectical framing by Leo Strauss in The City and Man. Now this book consists of a set of essays on Aristotle's politics, Plato's Republic, Thucydides' Peloponnesian Wars. It attempts to use classical political philosophy as a means of liberating modern political philosophy from the stranglehold of ideology. Much like Freud's attempt, I wanted to contrast Freud's psychoanalytic theory with Strauss's scope of political psychology. And the goal will be to examine sacred poetics from the ancient Greek philosophical milieu, especially Plato and Aristotle, and compare it with those of the Vedic high priests. And then we reach Marx himself. Now it was between Adam Smith and Karl Marx, but by special request I decided to engage a commentary on Marx's thesis on Feuerbach. Few of us read Marx, even fewer understand his habits of thought. In these 11 short philosophical notes that were written as a basic outline for the first chapter of his book, The German Ideology, I'm going to provide a commentary and examine some of the underlying sacred poetics and ascetic motifs of his critical theory. Maybe as a bonus, we'll use our newfound insights and reread the Communist Manifesto. The history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggles, it won't be surprising if the struggle is between the household and the grove. Now, I'm sure everyone at this point can take Victor Turner's insights on communitas to see a model for a flow state in the manifesto. I guess at this point, it would be appropriate to answer the question directly, what is the dialectic? For this, the voice of Alain Bedieu will guide us. In essence, the book The Rational Kernel of the Hegelian Dialectic captures a sort of war cry thus making it an appropriate text for political philosophy. Now, it is impossible to define the dialectic, since it is the means by which all definitions come into play, which itself is the recursive definition of the dialectic itself. And so instead, I will summarize the book with a definition from the book itself, in keeping with the motif of recursion. Transmission denotes the transfer of information, objects, or forces from one place to another, from one person to another. Transmission implies urgency, even emergency, a line humming, an alarm sounding, a messenger bearing news. Through transmission, interventions are supported, 
and opinions overturned. Transmission republishes classic works in philosophy, as it publishes works that re-examine classical philosophical thought. Transmission is the name for what takes place. And our goal here will be to learn what is meant by the dialectic in the contemporary grove. Like Leo Strauss, Alexander Dugan has also sought to escape the stranglehold of ideology. Now Dugan is certainly an authoritative interpreter of Plato in my eyes, certainly more so than most defenders of liberalism wishing to silence his voice, and thus a wanderer among the grove. We will take seriously his ambition of transcending what he calls the classical trinity of political theories into what he calls the fourth political theory, and pay attention to his treatment of asceticism in the realm of political theory. We will juxtapose Dugan to the Vedic ideals of sovereignty and the broader Indo-European tradition to study his take on asceticism. Alexander's political theory attempts to lay the foundations for a fourth political theory that integrates and supersedes liberal democracy, Marxism, and fascism. Dugan argues that the main subject of politics is not the individual, not class, nor the nation, but Dasein, existence. Accordingly, there is not just one global human civilization, but many different civilizations, each the product of their own unique historical, cultural, social, and political development. And so our goal for this book will be to determine whether a true human civilization is possible from the framework of Dugan. That is to say, in spite of the relativism that Dugan is arguing for, is there a possibility to unify? And we will examine the presence or absence of certain key sacred poetics from this novel proposal, and where lacking, maybe we might inject them. It should be obvious by the time we get to his work how most critiques against Dugan come from a purposeful neglect of the nuances in his use of language, especially by those seeking to undermine the ascetic sensibility. It is my opinion that the voice of Plato is more prominent in Dugan than Hobbes. Then we'll get to perhaps the most anticipated lecture, which will be reading Nietzsche's On the Genealogy of Morality, and hoping to get beyond his linguistic concerns for, about the ascetic ideal. Now, the genealogy of morality, or the genealogy of morals, calls to attention some aphorisms of his previous work, Beyond Good and Evil. For example, aphorism 54, he writes, For formerly one believed in the soul as one believed in grammar and the grammatical subject. One said, I is the condition, think is the predicate and conditioned. Thinking is an activity to which thought must supply a subject as cause. Then one tried, with admirable perseverance and cunning, to get out of this net, and asked whether the opposite might not be the case. Think, the conditioned, I, the conditioned. I, in that case, only a synthesis, which is made by thinking. At bottom, Kant wanted to prove that starting from the subject, the subject could not be proved, nor could the object. The possibility of a merely apparent existence of the subject, the soul, in other words, may not always have remained strange to him. That thought, which as Vedanta philosophy existed once before on this earth and exercised tremendous power. Now Nietzsche forms a coherent and complex discussion of morality in three essays. In the first essay, Good and Evil, Good and Bad. The second essay, Guilt, Bad Conscience, and Related Matters. And the third essay, What Do Ascetic Ideals Mean? We will take head-on the supposed critiques against asceticism in more recent times which come from trauma, guilt, and bad conscience, and related matters. And before getting into the neuroscience, we will have acquired a deep understanding of all the issues he addresses in this book anyways. It will be less of a refutation of his concerns and more of a gesture to his disciples to dispel with their hysteria and fears of asceticism and negative theology, that they should hold their breath and heal themselves before trying to heal others. Our goal will be to call attention to the importance of philology in philosophy. Now remember, Nietzsche was professor of classical philology, and thereby to understand the ascetic ideal, the superiority of the disciplined individual in the present. Just as the duo of Freud and Jung is no coincidence in the imagination of academics, the neuropsychiatrists, we will complement them with Nietzsche, the philologist, thereby establishing our representatives of dialectical neuroscience. The maxim shall be, there are no philosophers without philologists. 
And thus we will move to our first formal book on neuropsychiatry. And I think McGilchrist does a good job introducing the imagery of the grove to neuroscience in his work The Master and His Emissary, again a dialectical title. The book provides an overview of the differences between the right and left hemispheres, drawing upon a vast body of brain research. McGilchrist characterizes the hemispheres as two whole, coherent, but incompatible ways of experiencing the world. The detail-oriented left hemisphere prefers mechanisms to living things and is inclined to self-interest, while the right hemisphere has greater breadth, flexibility, and generosity. McGilchrist argues that the history of Western culture is founded upon the tension between these two worlds, as revealed in the thought and beliefs of thinkers and artists from the ancient to the modern. He ultimately argues that despite its inferior grasp of reality, the left hemisphere is increasingly taking precedence in today's world, with potentially disastrous consequences. Now I want to make a note here, to be weary of ethnocentrism. Obviously this book is an attempt at mapping the imagery of the Grove too, but without the rigorous backdrop of philology to complement a proper historical argument. The dialectic is far older than the West. By now, having studied the Vedic poetics, it will be clear to everyone that we have truly discovered something universal. The proof of the pudding was in the eating after all. And then we'll read a second book on neuropsychiatry, which will be titled Asceticism of the Mind by Inbar Gravir. Now Gravir argues that asceticism is founded on the possibility that human beings can profoundly transform themselves through training and discipline. That asceticism in the Eastern monastic tradition is based on the assumption that individuals are not slaves to the habitual and automatic, but can be improved by ascetic practice and, with the cooperation of divine grace, transform their entire character and cultivate special powers and skills. It explores the strategies that enabled Christian ascetics in the Egyptian, Ghazan, Sinaitic monastic traditions of late antiquity to cultivate a new form of existence. At the book center, is a model of ascetic discipline that involves a systematic effort to train the mind and purify attention. Drawing on contemporary cognitive and neuroscientific research, the book underscores the beneficial potential and self-formative role of the monastic system of mental training, thereby confuting older views that emphasize the negative and repressive aspects of asceticism. The book brings rigorously historical and cognitive perspectives in conjunction across a range of themes and in doing so opens up new ways of exploring asceticism and monasticism. I think Gravier does a good job in prostrating to the ascetics and therefore offers a more convincing argument about monasticism than contemporaries like Pascal Boyer. Gravier's emphasis on purifying attention, coupled with McGilchrist's hemisphere thesis, will provide to us the most expedient means into mapping the poetics of the frontal cortex, thus leaping into our next lecture series with these voices in mind. Having gone beyond the pleasure principle by not eating the pudding, we will discover its proof by negating it. And lastly, before we take our leave from the grove and dive into the scientific technicalities of neurobiology, we will put to rest the culture war, at least for those wandering the grove. In an essay titled Anti-Anti-Relativism by Clifford Geertz, Geertz attempts to destroy the fear of cultural relativism, not to defend relativism, but to attack anti-relativism. Now, whatever cultural relativism may be, or originally have been, these days, it serves largely as a specter to scare away from certain ways of thinking towards others. Data, not theory, has made the fields of the social sciences appear to be a huge argument against a universalist and absolutist view about social and cultural evolution. Now, having reached the end of the grove, we're going to retest that hypothesis, just like we do when we read Dugan. Our goal will be to put to rest the fear of fascism and relativism, and to reignite the universalizing, moralizing, ascetic sensibility. This time, weaving wisdom with science. We will have cultivated by this time an extremely rigorous and broad symbolic framework, which permits us to see even beyond the horizons of Geertz's own sentiments, by putting to rest various specters concerned with subjectivity in neuroscience, something we could potentially title hemispatial neglect, and reminding non-ascetics that weaving spiders come not here into these groves, lest they be judged by the kindling sticks. 
Thus, in council with 28 of the countless voices of the Grove, we will have established the sufficient threads required to weave our rigorous and comprehensive framework. Surely we will meet with voices greater than 28, but these 28 will serve as our breadcrumbs until we learn to navigate with the skies. This won't be the first time philology has been invoked when discussing foundations. As the brilliant Paul once wrote in his paper, The Return to Philology. But, in practice, the turn to theory occurred as a return to philology, to an examination of the structure of language prior to the meaning it produces. This is so even amongst the most controversial French theoreticians. Foucault's first major work, The Order of Things, as the title indicates, has to do with the referential relationship between language and reality. But it approaches the question not in terms of philosophical speculation, but much more pragmatically, as it appears in the methodological innovations of social scientists and philologists. Whereas Derrida's starting point, though more traditionally philosophical in appearance, stresses the empirical powers of language over those of intuition and knowledge. His critique of phenomenology in the name of linguistics, by way of Husserl and Saussure, bears this out. Even in the case of Nietzsche, a frequent point of reference for all these writers, the accent falls on Nietzsche the philologist rather than on Nietzsche the existential nihilist. Which reminds me of the infamous passage of Derrida, who wrote, If he loves justice at least, the scholar of the future, the intellectual of tomorrow, should learn it, and from the ghost. He should learn to live by learning not how to make conversation with the ghost, but by how to talk with him, with her, how to let them speak, or how to give them back speech, even if it is in oneself, in the other, in the other in oneself. They are always there, specters, even if they do not exist, even if they are no longer, even if they are not yet. The journey through the wilderness is renowned, and this prince of postmodernism, not yet king of the wild things, rely too heavily on critique, and not enough on asceticism. And he was in the wilderness for forty days, being tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild animals, and the angels were serving him. But our prince forgot to serve the angels, the ascetics. This isn't the first time voices of the Grove have attempted to embrace the totality of sacred poetics. Recur once tackled this monstrosity in writing, We have at our disposal a symbolic logic, an exegetical science, an anthropology, and a psychoanalysis, and perhaps for the first time we are able to encompass in a single question the problem of the unification of human discourse. The very progress of the aforementioned disparate disciplines has revealed and intensified the dismemberment of that discourse. Today, the unity of human language poses a problem. And where there's a problem, there's a wilderness. And to those who have abandoned the desire for such a unification, we have in the wilderness the voice of Geertz. If we wanted home truths, we should have stayed home. That is to say, just because it's difficult, it doesn't make it impossible. This being said, I formally welcome you to the Grove, the realm of Odin, god of the midweek, god of frenzy, anger, rudeness, and poetic inspiration.
डमरू हर कर बाजे 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 डमरू 